We're live. I don't relax all the time. I don't know. Amos. Took a long time. What about you, Rosalie? You don't sleep, eh? Mr. Chair and Madam Chair, we got. <laughs> <laughs> I believe we're I believe we're streaming live, Vince, so we can start. We are live now. We're live, right. good. So I called the uh, meeting. Uh, I believe all the uh, license and health committee members are present. So I, I'd like to have a roll call. Are we there? Alderman Vitale. Here. Grisham. Here. Ranky. Here. Wrote. Here. Stefanski. Here. Five present. Well, we all present. Thank you. So tonight we have uh, a couple of items, uh, metal for discussion. I believe some of the topics are general license concept, which uh, our assistant city attorney Nick will kind of go through with that, you know, as, as good as possible to kind of uh, give us some insights and more in details. Is that correct, Nick? Yep, that's very good. You want, want me to start right away? Sure, let's do it now. All right. What I'm going to do is share my screen then so you can all see the PowerPoint on this screen. I, you can also have it up or printed with yourself as well, but that way everyone can see what we're talking about at home. Um, additionally, uh, it would be good if you had the works report or the example that I had sent out up. And so when we get to that point, we can kind of go through that fairly quickly. So I'm going to try to share the screen now. I practiced this morning at work. Fingers crossed. Whoops. Start on page one. Can everyone see that? You yes. start page yep. two, right? Uh, page two or three, right, Nick? I'm on, I should be on page one right now if you're looking at the title screen. Yes, that, that's fine. I, I have that. All right. Uh, so this is an amended version of a, um, a training that Kale put on back in March of 2019. So I added some slides, I added some information, more basic information about licensing and then some amendments or updates regarding ordinances that have changed since the time that we had, um, he had given this. So um, Kale's name is on the bottom there. I believe Kale is also um, listening in. And so if he has any comments, I would encourage him to chime in. Um, and I will try to go as quickly as I can. If you have questions, feel free to jump in at any point or wait till the end. If we're running short on time and I'm going too fast, um, feel free to email me or call me um, or stop in whenever we can go, whenever, whenever I'm back in the office um, full time and we can talk about this more specifically one-on-one -on -one or um, as you need, okay? So the general topics we're gonna discuss are general licensing concepts including the licensing philosophy, protecting against discrimination, actions against licenses, making an appropriate record, and then kind of a basic license flow chart. When I ran that through the clerk's office, I'm told it is a very basic license flow chart. And so um, I've left out a lot of the odds and ends on that one. And then getting more specifically into alcohol licensing, um, some legal or some required licenses for alcohol, qualifications and discretion, what a rational basis means for making decisions, um, and then adding conditions to a new class A, B, and C license and some specific regulations that West Dallas has um, beyond the state law, but in, in addition to the state law, not in conflict with the state law. Then we'll talk about operator's licenses and then review the key concepts, the key takeaways, since this is kind of um, somewhat dense material, and then hopefully there'll be time for questions. I know there's still the agenda items to discuss um, for those ordinances, so I want to make sure I leave enough time for the committee on that as well. So um, if at all, uh, Alderman Vitale, we're getting long and you want me to stop, just let me know. I have no problem with that. No, you're fine. You, you just right now, I think we, we're on the right track. We all are, I believe. You're good. So starting off very generally, what is a license or why do we have licenses for certain conduct? Um, it's mostly about public trust. Licensed activities are inherently something that is a unique concern to the public. So that oversight or the license generally helps to control that problem or to be able to correct the problems. Effectively, what that means is licensure is quality over quantity. 
there needs to be a qualified person, a licensed person doing the job, as opposed to as many light or as many people doing the job or the task as anybody would want. The authority that grants that license must review an applicant's qualifications for that license, which is what in large part the committee will be doing. And then getting a new license is a privilege for the most part, and we'll talk about that but an existing license is a property right. And that's a very, very important concept between the two differences or distinctions there. And then lastly, the Common Council, along with the state law sets the boundaries and regulations on these licenses, specifically alcohol licensing is very regulated by the state um, in addition to our own code. So again, at the very high level, when a license, when we have a license, we have options or something we can do with that license. We can grant it, deny it, or take some action against the licensee once it's granted. But the thing we have to be most careful about, or one of the things we have to be most careful about, is uh, discrimination showing up or cropping up in licensing. This is one of the places that a committee or a council can find themselves um, being reviewed in court quickly. And so we absolutely cannot make decisions based on discrimination. So I want to make sure we point that out in the areas that are most, um, at least most overtly protected are age, race, creed, color, disability, marital status, sex, national origin, ancestry, arrest record, conviction record. They're two different things. Military service, use or non-use of lawful products during non-working hours, participation or non-participation in any communication about religious matters or political matters. So I bring that up because there's kind of two forms of discrimination that we gotta be most mindful of. Intentional discrimination, which is fairly overt. Uh, I think we would all kind of generally know what that is. It's clearly prohibited, usually obvious, taking some act, um, whether it be an individual or organization that sets out deliberately to disadvantage one of those protected classes. The thing that I want to most importantly touch on when in this training is unintentional discrimination or whether as the courts put it, your decisions that you make have a disparate impact on a protected class. Disparate impact meaning uh, basically unequal impact between a protected class and an unprotected class or something along those lines. Unintentional discrimination is still protected or prohibited, I mean, so you can't do it even if we're not meaning to do it but we're creating a pattern of conduct or our policies create a pattern of conduct, um, we can still get in trouble for something like that. So I want to make sure that we're aware of our decisions and we're making um, a good record. And that's segueing into how do we avoid unintentional discrimination, um, be consistent in your reasonings for denying a license, and then avoid placing a condition or denying a license for a reason that could impact a protected class particularly. Is the for me, the um, Zoom is kind of blocking some of the slides. I, I don't know if it's doing that for you or making that happen. So I'll, I'm not sure if that changes anything for anybody. I just, I just moved my window uh, okay. to see the rest of it. So you can, just for everybody else, there's like a, a window that will show up and you can minimize it. The far left little icon is the smallest like flat icon and you can use that. Okay. Thank you. Yep. All right, on to actions. Is that where we're at? Yes. Actions against a license. So once a license is issued, the council can take action to suspend, revoke, or refuse to renew a license. Each license may have a separate or a different standard that justify discipline. And so if you actually look through the code, whether it be alcohol licensing, which we're talking about today, or some other type of license, um, they might have different types of violations that would that would satisfy suspension, revocation, or non-renewal of that license. Once again, once a license is issued, that's a, a property interest. And so there has to be a process in place um, that takes that property interest away, a due process. That's what it's called. So that's why we have hearings on those. In these hearings, the committee would act as the fact finder and make a recommendation to the common council for the appropriate remedy to the alleged violations. For this reason, and I've talked about it before, is that we have to be very mindful and careful about prejudging a disciplinary matter. 
And so there may be circumstances where um, reports come up or we want to talk about or kind of talk to a licensee, but be mindful that the, the more record we make, um, creating, creating that record of discipline, we should be very, very careful in terms of prejudging it if it's going to be used for a later action uh, where you'd have to use your fact finder or kind of quasi judicial hat and judge the matter. That'd be neutral and base your decision on evidence at the hearing. And then if discipline is warranted, it should match the severity of the incident in addition to the parameters set forth in our code of the state law. Did I hear a question there? Is there any questions uh, from any members for Nick? Not right now. Very good. All right, making a record. So as we are aware, and we were just getting on here, the License and Health Committee meetings are all recorded and available on the West Dallas YouTube page. And so uh, to protect against discrimination and to protect for future potential litigation, it's important to make an appropriate record um, generally across the board, but specifically when we are denying a new license for a a, class A, B, or C license, when we're granting a new class A, B, or C license with conditions that are placed on that license, when we're denying an operator's license, particularly if it's based on conviction or arrest, or when we're making a determination after a hearing, so if they're going for suspension, revocation, or denial of a new license, and obviously those decisions by the Common Council may be subject to review by the circuit court. We have been there, I have been there in circuit court on matters um, that were being reviewed, and so it does happen. Best practice is, is to make an appropriate record of your decisions and or motions with a rational basis. Uh, you'll hear that echoed a few times throughout the, the slides here. We're gonna talk about more specific alcohol-based rational basis um, later on when we get to the alcohol. But basically what that means is your decisions, your motion has to be rationally related to legitimate government interest. And then also always remember that a, a member of the city attorney staff should always be present at meetings to assist you uh, on these and may ask for um, clarifying information on your motion just to make sure that it is, is a sound if and when we have to be on the record. Um, if we do a hearing on these matters, then you will have likely two attorneys, one being the prosecutor and one advising the committee. Um, and so you'll have a few of us there with you. This is that very basic flow chart. Um, Anne-Marie Neff was so kind as to help me uh, kind of create the logistics of this, but I think her version had um, 13 or 14 steps and there's a few A, Bs or Cs in there. And so there's a, there's a lot that goes into this process. I've oversimplified it just to make sure I can fit it on a slide, but um, this is the general flow chart for when an application or a license application comes into West Dallas. The application is turned in, the clerk's office enters that information into a database for building inspection, fire, and the health department to use for their inspections. The clerk's office works with the West Dallas Police Department and the city attorney's office to review databases for conviction information. We'll talk about those databases more, but generally they are the DOT or the Department of Transportation, the works report, which I'll get into later. There's gonna be a local check and then I've started adding on CCAP just to, to clarify a few things because the works report, as you have seen and will see, um, is interestingly organized. Um, the application is added to the agenda for license and health. All reviewed documents um, that have been generated by staff are provided to the committee. Depending on the actions of license and health, a license is either granted, denied, or additional dates are set. And then the clerk's office makes sure before any, any license is issued that all of the respective departments have signed off on their part of the license. Again, that's a, that is a way, way far back version of how this all looks. More specifically on alcohol licensing now. So there are three general types of licenses for an establishment to sell alcohol. They are the class A, which is a liquor or beer store. They're licensed as a class A liquor, a class A fermented malt beverage or a combination of the two. That allows an entity or the, the licensee of a class A to sell 
packages or containers of alcohol for off premises consumption, generally sealed packages or containers. There is some provisions for a small quantity of alcohol to be consumed on premises in, in class A's, uh, mostly taste testing and things along those lines. Class B's are bars and restaurants. They're licensed as a class B liquor, class B fermented malt beverage, or a combination of the two. That allows for open or closed containers for on or off premises consumption. And then class C is a wine only. They're only for certain restaurants, um, predominantly determined by um, kind of the, the general sales of alcohol and percentages and other parameters defined by Wisconsin Statute 125 particular primarily. Uh, and again, that's only for selling wine in original open containers for on-site consumption. These are all created by chapter 125 generally, more specifically the whole chapter, but 125.25, 125.26, and 125.51. And then class A's have a uh, very important, I'm sorry, I underline this part specifically is because the statute reads that these are may issue licenses, meaning that the committee and the council has discretion mm -hmm. to issue these licenses. And we'll talk about that more in a moment here. Other licenses are shall issue licenses. The most common that you'll see is the operators or bartenders license. They're the same thing. Operators license is how it's called in Wisconsin statute. So there's a big difference between may issue and shall issue licenses. So when that license comes in for a class A, B, or C, there's effectively two steps. One, whether or not the applicant is qualified. Those qualifications come from state law. So what's required is the applicant does not have arrest an arrest or conviction record that has or is um, largely governed by Wisconsin Statute 111.335. You'll hear me um, harp on that a lot when I'm asking whether or not the conviction substantially relates to the license activity. The next qualification is that the person, entity, or agent has to be a resident of Wisconsin for at least the last 90 days continuously. They have to be 21 years or older. They have to have a seller's permit in Wisconsin, and they have to complete a responsible server course or have been recently a licensee or an agent. We can only consider those convictions, as I had said, if they're substantially related to the license activity. But there is a caveat there for drug convictions, specifically drug convictions for manufacture, delivery, or possession with intent. And so felony level drug crimes are generally things that do not impact or do not need to substantially relate to the license activity. Those are convictions that um, can be considered. <coughs> the qualifications talk about arrest or conviction record. So if we're gonna look at the arrest record, um, that is much more difficult because Wisconsin statute 111.335 requires it to be substantially related to the license activity in addition to being a specified offense, which if I can break them down into two general categories would be a violent crime, specific violent crimes against people, um, children or adults would be the two categories. Nick, I got a quick question. You bet. Yeah. So if they have a felony, we can't look at that when it comes to giving them a license? Is that what you're saying? You can. You can look at it, but you'd have to make a finding that it sub substantially relates to the license activity. There, so, are, there are other places where this would come up as well, is if, um, I know when we talked at the last meeting, there was somebody who had uh, several felonies, and so habitual criminality would also be another area where we could tie that into. Would And so drug dealing or drug possession, drug manufacturing would be considered because they would be in a position to be able to distribute through a, being a bartender, correct? I, I guess that would be my, my assumption that why that's an exclusion in this case. Um, but just for a, a hard line rule, we don't, if the person has drug convictions, that doesn't mean they'd automatically don't. If the committee would like that person to be a, a bartender, for example, um, or a um, class A, B, or C licensee, they could still be if you determine that that's appropriate, but we don't, you don't have to tie a drug conviction drug manufacturer, delivery, or possession with intent to um, being substantially related to the license activity. Okay. It's just a simpler, slightly simpler process. Thank you. Yep. So if a somebody, if a licensee for a class A, B, or C is denied a license based on a conviction, then they must be allowed a chance to show competent evidence of rehabilitation 
and fitness. And there's statutory places or, or statutory ways they can show that to the committee. Nick. Yes. Uh, domestic violence is not included in this list. Does that have any bearing on whether um, you can approve the application? I'd have to look at the index offenses. I don't have them specifically listed in front of me right now. Um, it, it depends what the domestic violence offense was. And so there's domestic violence um, enhancers that can have a disorderly conduct domestic violence. Depending on how, how the committee tailors their argument in terms of how it substantially relates, you'd have to be very careful. I would say not it's not absolute that domestic violence would make somebody prohibited from um, being a, a licensed agent. I see. Uh, so once, once we get through the qualifications, if you determine a class A, B, or C licensee meets the qualifications, that's not where you have to stop for class A, B, or C because they are discretionary or a may issue license. So once we get through that, the person can, or the, the applicant can fail at that first step, or we can go on to step two here. And in step two, this is where you exercise discretion. If a qualified applicant is denied, you must have a rational basis for denying that person or that entity, and it must be non-discriminatory. So even if the applicant is qualified, the committee can still reject it for various reasons so long as they're rationally based on um, a government interest or, or community interest. In a slide or two, we're gonna to get to very specific examples that have been upheld by the law. So that might help you kind of wrap your mind about what around what a rational basis would be. Um, the ability to deny qualified applicants is unique to new applications. And so once again, once somebody is granted a license, if it's a renewal, so they've already been operating for a year, um, there's a process in place. You can't automatically deny them. They have to have a hearing at that point. And this does not issue to shall issue licenses like the operator's license. Once they meet the qualifications in an operator's license, you don't have discretion over that anymore. There is case law in point that there's not a need to state the reason for denial. However, I would say it would be helpful. And so my best practice would be, although the court had says in a specific case, um, you don't have to give your reasons, if we're litigating this and you have an attorney present, um, I, my bet, if it was me, is I'm going to advise you um, to kind of state your reasons on the record for making the decision. Also, when we're issuing a new license, this is the only opportunity, this is a very important point as well, an only opportunity to place conditions upon that license. This has to be done or should be, this has to be done on the record and it should appear on the license. And so appearing on the license is the clerk's issue and they'll do that. Making sure it appears on the record is something the committee has to do at the time of issuing the license. There's a slide on this as well, so we'll get to that in a second. You can also postpone the decision if you are unclear or need more information. And then once that license is granted, again, the applicant has a property interest and this standard is inapplicable. This doesn't apply anymore. We have to go through a due process hearing. So I've hit the keyword rational basis a few times now. Excuse me. What has the court determined a rational basis could or would be? All the citations underneath, underneath each of these are to court cases. Um, it's gibberish if you didn't go to law school or read a lot of court cases. I don't like to read these, they're boring. So um, feel free, but I will give you the, the Cliff Notes version here. Um, some examples include past problems with the applicant of a license past problems with the landlord of an applicant, the problems in the neighborhood based on management or location, moral character of an applicant, financial responsibility of the applicant, appropriateness of the location and of the premises proposed. The committee might just not want bars in the area. There might not be too many bars in the area. The applicant could have falsified or provided incomplete information on an application or a separate kind of consideration is um, the sequence in which an application comes in or is received does not matter. It's not first come first serve. And so if there is an application for um, a corner bar or there, and that comes in before an application for a big new development in the same kind of general area, we don't have to consider the smaller bar first before we consider 
what might be a, a million dollar, a multi-million dollar development. You can pick and choose your way through these licenses. You have discretion over that. Mr. Chairman, wrote. Yes, yes. Uh, oh, yeah. Nick, Nick, could you please touch just briefly on financial responsibility of the applicant? It was noted in a case. Uh, I'd have to look at the case a little bit more specifically. I did read over that. It was in the end of the case and the court just said considerations like moral character of the applicant and financial responsibility of the applicant are, are can be considerations. And it didn't really even appear much before that in the case, as far as I recall. And so I think what that would mean to me if I was advising the committee is if if you know that this entity or you have information that the entity has failed several times in the past or the person doesn't um, won't be able to uphold their debts or something along those lines for a class A, B or C, I think that could be a rationale you can consider um, in terms of, hey, we want to issue these licenses to entities that are, are, are fiscal responsible, that they will um, do a good job in communities, run a tight ship. Um, not cut corners. And so I think that's that's a, something that can be considered. I'd want to make sure that we have, as we talk about a few times here, a rational basis or have some information to base that on, though, not just kind of a hunch. Mr. Chair, if I may, one more. Yes, yes. Uh, wrote again. I have been without automobile insurance for the last three years because I don't have the money to pay for automobile insurance. Is that financial responsibility? I would, I would say no. Um, it depends on what we're talking about. So this is a class A, B, or C license that we're talking about here. So these are these are establishments that are going to be selling. So you're going to be looking at the convictions for a class A, B, or C agent, primarily. We're not talking about operator's licenses at this point. And so if we're talking about financial responsibility, it would be, I think, tied to their ability to operate as a class A, B, or C, or run a business or something along those lines. Um, obviously, my job as the attorney for the committee is if you are making such a motion or basing it on that, um, I will try to make sure that it is sound. And if we have to defend that in court, I'm doing the best I can, but I will try to guide you to be careful in some of those circumstances. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Nick? No questions, so let's proceed. That's okay, so I'm going to whip through this, Scott, the village of Kiwaskum pretty quick. But this is where we come up with um, some of these first rational basis um, examples. And so it's a pretty good case on point. Effectively, the Scots brought up, bought a property that had been a tavern for about 125 years. Um, long standing. Around the end of the 1970s, early 1980s, the bar through the Scots um, was given or provided to the sons and a partner and then to a tenant. The tenant was evicted. Um, and so a new applicant applied for the bar in nine, or for the license for a bar in 1982. That new applicant was denied. So the bar owner, Ralph Scott, applied for the license. And um, he was provided a, although it had been a year since, or years, more than a year since his license, for some reason, the committee still granted him a hearing. The, the court touched on that a little bit because it might not have been even necessary, but they granted him a hearing nonetheless. And um, what the court found is that the, the reasons given on via testimony were sufficient. The village board did not give a reason for denying the license, but because there was testimony on the record of the property being a problem over those years, uh, it was a, an appropriate exercise of discretion and the denial was rationally based on a, on a government or community interest. Um, therefore, it was permissible to deny the license to sell liquor in a particular village at a particular time as long as it does not imply a general disqualification from the occupation. I think another important quote here was that although the statute sp specifies people to whom licenses must be denied, it does not say when a license must be granted, specifically for class A, B, or C. And so again, it, it really brings up the point that the committee has discretion in these should rationally tie it to a, uh, an interest of the community. Um, but as long as we can do that, you're gonna have a decent shot. And it's, a, it's the attorney's job to help you there for that. Moving on then to another very important point is adding conditions to a license. And so um, we added this, I think it was last year. It's been since Kale has been here. And so um, cities are allowed to place license or conditions on a license only on the new issued licenses, okay? So once it's issued, we kind of lose our chance to do this. 
The conditions must be rationally related to the license, non-discriminatory, and not in conflict with state law. And we have to have added an ordinance to do so. So we have done all of that. And now we have two ordinances. Well, it's one ordinance on the books. It was entered via two ordinances. Um, the conditions that may be placed on the license include, and would have to be on the record, include a licensee conducting a principal business as described. And so when they apply, they say, I'm going to run this in a certain way. It's going to be a um, bowling alley, just as an example. Uh, and we say you cannot change it into a, a disco. It has to remain a bowling alley. That's the principal business that you've described, uh, and you have to keep it that way. They have to maintain another potential would be maintaining the property in accordance with the landscape and art architectural designs. You may add that they are required to keep video surveillance to a certain specified requirements, uh, which are enumerated in our law as well. They have to maintain security measures, maintain a certain layout, or limitations on promotions or activities. Um, we can add to that. If you have ideas on other ones, you should reach out to me or Kale individually if you have ideas on that. Um, but these are the, the conditions that may be added at the time of issuing a new class A, B, or C. We have other regulations that West Dallas has imposed on ourself. Um, they are not in conflict with chapter 125, and so we've added these in. We basically have two main um, regulations. One's gonna be our self-imposed quota system. And our second is we added, I think it was in 2017 or thereabouts, maybe 2016, 2017, um, we added class A as a special use. The quota system, how that works or what that looks like is that we have, we've limited ourselves to 30 class A establishments, 120 class B establishments, and one, uh, in 10 licenses limited to class B fermented malt beverage only, so only um, 10 beer only establishments. To exceed that self-imposed quota, there must be a public hearing. To illustrate what could be, um, the state law imposes a limit of 137. So we've, we've chopped ourselves down by, at the very outset, about 27 uh, plus, I'm sorry, about 17. And then there's plus 10 reserve licenses. So there's actually 147 licenses um, by state law that we could issue. We've just had our own self-imposed limit at 120. We are currently at 31 class A's. So we've gone over quota with a public hearing for one, 123 class B's, so three over quota, and then 10 class B fermented malt beverage only. Additionally, we have that special use section. And so in addition, when a class A wants to go into any commercial, um, area or above, it would have to be a special use, meaning that they have to have a separate application fee and public hearing to approve um, what needs to take place in order to operate. I point those out as a potential discussion point later or in the future. All right, so that was on class A, B, or C licenses. Now we're gonna switch gears a little bit to a shall issue license on an operator's license. This is what you had reviewed already on uh, last week. The key differences here is that, well, class A, B, or C is a two-step process. If you recall, it's whether or not the licensee is qualified and then whether or not we want to issue that license based on a rational basis. A class or a operator's license is a shall issue license. What an operator's license does is it allows a person essentially to, to sell beer, but it's not mandatory to sell beer. Effectively, they can be like a manager on, on, a, um, on site. Uh, they don't have to have anybody supervising them. They can kind of close up shop or be the only bartender there. I think they have some supervisory power um, over others if they have a direct line of sight. <clears throat> we can only deny an operator's license if the applicant does not meet the qualifications necessary for licensure. So that's where we missed that step two. Those qualifications include being at least 18 years old, Subject to 111.335, the applicant must not have a conviction record of a crime that substantially relates to the license activity or be a habitual law offender. They must complete an approved responsible beverage course and pay the license fee. So when we're reviewing the qualifications, the conviction record is generally a point of 
discussion, I will say. And so when that comes up, you're going to be reviewing and staff will create and review several databases. Um, that's the West Dallas Police Department records, DOT records, the works report, which stands for Wisconsin Online Record Check System, and then again, CCAP. Those documents and records are used to determine if an applicant meets the qualifications. And we try to make that spreadsheet for you to help you review these because as you'll see in a moment, the works report is pretty brutal. If an applicant is denied based on a conviction history that substantially relates, that must be in writing. So the clerk's office has to issue the denial in writing, specifically how the circumstances of the offense relate to the license activity. That's in state law. And so when I ask you to clarify the record every once in a while on an operator's license, that's why, to kind of relieve whomever the clerk is and help them make a good record. And then we have to allow the applicant an opportunity to present competent evidence of rehabilitation. I've referenced that already before, but that's where our process kind of comes in with the two-step process. There's the initial review, and then we sometimes send that denial letter to people, which um, puts the reasons in writing and gives them the opportunity to come in and show competent evidence of rehabilitation. If they show competent evidence of rehabilitation, which is defined by statute, um, then you must issue that license. There's not a discretionary role for an operator's license. And so if, for example, one of them is a competent evidence of rehabilitation is um, successfully complete their extended supervision or term of probation, um, that is statutory, a statutory way that they can show you that they've completed their rehabilitation and we must then issue the license. Here's where we get to the works report. So I'm gonna switch off, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for a second here and I'm gonna ask everybody to switch over to that works report example that I had sent. And I see we're almost out of time that I wanted to talk. So I'm gonna kind of kick through this pretty quick, okay? <clears throat> Go ahead, Nick. Thank you. Let me pull that up. So if we're looking at the works report, it's a long document, specifically this one's a long document. The first few pages here, if you go through page almost until you get to the picture, so three pages are nothing. I would not worry about those pages. The third page in this report specifically, you wanna make sure that you have the right person that we're talking about. I'm not gonna say this person's name here just because it doesn't matter. Um, and then we'll get into how to review it. So each incident is defined or kind of separated out by these red cycles. For some reason, it's not the biggest text on there, but it's a red lettering called cycles. You'll see this person has a few cycles here. And even though there's a cycle on there, meaning a police contact, it does not mean that it's a conviction. So I'll be very careful on how I recommend you use works if you're using it yourself and not reviewing it with the, the spreadsheet. So if we're looking at cycle one, starting on page four, you'll see that there was a charge reference as possession of THC, which generally would have been a misdemeanor just because you see on page five that it says misdemeanor there, that does not mean that she was charged with a crime. That means the potential severity of a possession of THC is a misdemeanor. And then it ends, it begins cycle two. So that's the end of all the records we have on that interaction. I don't know what happened there and I would not recommend the committee would re reference something that we don't have clear indication is usable. Then on page five, we go to cycle two. And again, we have another possession of THC. Possession or the potential severity, at least the police department thought it was, was a potential felony. At some point on the bottom of page five, we see the charge section there. It says a misdemeanor. I'm not sure what's going on, but ultimately, if you scroll on the page six, there's a court section, which is C-kept disposition unknown at that point. What I also can learn from this section is the charge is possession of THC. And then underneath that, at the very bottom of the charge section on page six, it says comments amend slash other. And then disposition amend by prosecutor in court. I don't know for certain what happened, but my inkling is that this was amended to a ticket in court when this occurred. There was a conviction of that ticket. Um, disposition was not reported. I don't know what else happened. Again, works reports are difficult to understand. So this is, again, I would best guess say this is a ticket converted to a ticket. Our best example here is cycle three. Cycle three is a ton of arresting information and charge data. The problem there is that's what the police think it's gonna be and that's how it gets logged into the, um, the system here. 
and you'll see it duplicated or referenced several, several times, but we should go to page 14. So follow me all the way down there to 14. When we get to 14, you'll see there finally becomes a portion where it talks about disposition convicted, and you see a sentence there underneath that, or sentencing, it says probation. And so now I know that there's a case number associated with that. It's a 17 CF number under sentencing. Again, I'm not gonna read the whole thing. And we know that somebody was convicted of that and they got probation. There's more sentencing information that follows underneath that. And so what that tells me is this was a legitimate sentence by a criminal court, which imposed probation on this individual among other conditions. Um, and so now we finally have a usable conviction that we can consider in terms of a, uh, if we wanna consider it, if it would substantially relate to the license activity or we can make that motion. As you can see, these are really, really cumbersome and I'm gonna, you, by all means, review them. They may confuse you more than they're worth. I will try my very best to cross-reference these with CCAP and make sure I'm giving you functional, usable information. All right, I'm gonna get off of these now. Um, if you have more questions on works report, it, it may be best to just ask me at some other point because they are pretty dense, but I'm happy to answer questions at any point. Oops, I gotta share my screen again. Are you okay now, Nick? Lost yep, I'm just sharing my screen again. And I'm almost done. We all see that? Mm-hmm, yes. Okay. Yeah, I see it. All right, and so this is all the right. conviction spreadsheet. Um, we've all seen this already at least once. This is where the abbreviations are gonna come in generally. Um, so my apologies for that. I can I can tell you what they mean generally in, in person. OWI means operated while intoxicated. Um, DOT stands for Department of Transportation. DL status means driver's license status. Um, OAR means operate after revocation. There's gonna be a lot of short information in a short space here, but this is where various departments are breaking down the information for a quick reference for you. We've already reviewed this applicant specifically um, previously, but this is just a general idea of what it's gonna look like. Um, I'm happy to answer more questions on this as you see fit. When we have this, another point and another question that was asked previously very quickly is that on the agenda tonight, um, there are three names that were approved previously, not the whole gamut of names, because when you approved three of those operator's licenses on the last date, those are the ones that had um, didn't have convictions that substantially related. And so they are on the agenda tonight, only three of them for approval. The remainder, the ones that were quote unquote soft denial will be sent letters to appear at a later point um, for uh, to show competent evidence of rehabilitation or the potential for that. So quickly, important concepts to remember. Um, the activity being licensed is, in, is inherently something that's unique concern to the public. We have to make sure we do not have intentional or uh, unintentional discrimination to protect against that. Make a good record and base your um, decisions on a rational basis. New ABC licenses are discretionary. Operators license are mandatory issue. If you're talking about a new class A, B, or C, you can add a condition to that license, but only at the time it's being issued. And then if we are denying anybody for a conviction or an arrest record, they have to substantially relate and they have to be given a chance to come in and, and try to talk you out of it. That's the nuts and bolts very densely um, put about licensing. I'm happy to answer questions now, or if you think of any in the future, this is my job and I'm happy to answer them. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Nick. Yeah. Vince, your microphone's muted. Vince, can you hear us? Your microphone. Yeah, I can hear you. But okay, I, there we go. I have no screen right now. Yeah, you're okay now. So that's, that's it. There's, there was um, agenda item two that I put on there as well, which, which kind of ties into this training. Um, yeah. But that, that we can talk about another day, if you want. Mr. Chair. No, no, no screen right now. I've stopped sharing my screen. 
And so yeah, no, no. Let's see what oh. I have anymore. Can you click the box in the kind of towards the top right? You might have minimized it before when he was going through his presentation. What happened now? We can see you, Vince, and we can hear you. I know, but uh, but I I have nothing here. Vince, are you on the iPad? Yes. No, an iPad, I, laptop. Laptop. Okay, if you go up to the upper right part of your screen, right above the, um, right below the bar that's up on top that says Zoom, if you go right below that, you should be able to click on either the enter full screen or speaker view. Okay, let me see. Okay, now. Okay, let me. Oh my goodness. Vince, um, yes. this is at Grisham. We could still continue at the meeting whether you have a uh, view on the screen or not because I believe that Nick has already shared everything that is going yeah, to be uh, for well, view. Is that okay fine. if we move forward? Sure. Sure, he mentioned okay, something about discussion, uh, number two, discussions about the uh, guideline for the clerk office. But, uh, but I don't think, uh, so, so, so any questions about that? Number two? Mr. Chair, if I may? Yes. This is the way. So we, we generally talked about those uh, on the last session and we talked about those um, when we were yes. setting the agenda. And so I added that on there as a discussion point if we had time. Um, my advice would be that because what those generally are is, is how the clerk's office organizes the agenda for operators license that come to the committee. And so those applicants that don't, right now how it's working is those applicants that don't have any convictions or only have uh, driving records, not including OA operating after revocation or operat operating after suspensions will kind of be placed on a, a separate side of the agenda, basically a consent agenda. Anybody else who has a record will be placed in a, in a category for everybody to review. That's just generally what those guidelines are for. If you want to change those guidelines, we can talk about that at another point if you'd like, or now. Yeah, that'd be I'll fine. I, I think we can talk some other time then. Okay. Mr. Chair? Yes. Road here. Road, yes. No, no I'm Say on Nick. Again. Okay. Say, okay. Nick, would you, I don't know if you were asking for our opinion or input, but on the works um, item that you send us all the time, and I heard the word cumbersome come out of your mouth a couple of times. Can we just get away with that cheat sheet? The last slide that you showed us, could we just see that rather than all of that work stuff, which is cumbersome? <laughs> I like that word in, in terms of the works report. Um, you can, I'm only putting information on there that I am confident um, is accurate. And so I think you can use that because that's why I'm generating it for you. I don't want to take away information from you. And so if you want to review those work reports, I, works reports, I think they're still being sent out. They were being populated, I think, last year, um, but the police department was doing their own search. And so since we've kind of adjusted the, the process in terms of how long it takes for the police to do their job, um, the works report became more important. And that's where it's coming to you now. I think you can rely on my spreadsheet as well, though. And when you say spreadsheet, you're in essence, what I'm calling the cheat sheet, right? The last slide that you showed us. Yes. Okay. And just my humble opinion, I I like that a lot, a lot better than the works. And I will just yeah. leave it at that. Fair. Thank you. That's good. So, so now we can move on. Uh, Nick, I believe you don't have anything at this point, right? Anymore? I don't have anything in terms of the training materials. There was the agenda yes. item three, I think, left. Are you talking about item three, Nick? Yeah, agenda item three, discussion regarding potential options for reduction in fees for certain yes. licenses. Mr. So, Chair? So, yes. Do we, do we um, want to adjourn this discussion until the recess meeting because we're running out of time? Or do you want to take it up okay. and then adjourn, adjourn right at right at seven o'clock? Well, we could do it during recess at the uh, council meeting. That'll be fine. Sure, no problem. Recess. Okay. We could we could take care of that at recess. 
Okay. It'd be okay for the other members? Everyone agree on that? That works for me. That works. What about, that works? Okay, we yeah. do that at recess then. Thank you. So then we move on with the, uh, I mean, uh, we have a three and four, which will be uh, reported the, uh, during the uh, council meeting after recess. So. Uh, I make a motion it. that we adjourn license and health until the recess committee meetings. Second. Second. Grisham. Everybody in favors? Aye. 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 Those, they I have it. Thank you guys. Now we go to the next agenda to the